listening to my comprehensive guide on how to emulate almost every Ace Combat game on PC. In this series of videos, I'll be covering everything you need to know, from which emulators to use, how to set up these emulators, the files, fixes, and cheats needed to address emulation issues related to Ace Combat, as well as some of the best and recommended settings for each game. All the necessary links will be in the video description, as well as links to some of the materials I've referenced to make these guides. Note that due to some legal issues surrounding emulation, I will not be able to provide nor directly link to some of the critical files needed for some of these emulators to function. Don't worry though, I will provide some guidance on where you'll be able to find these files yourself. It really isn't too difficult. In this second part of my full Ace Combat emulation guide, I'll be covering the three Ace Combat games released for the PlayStation 2, also known in the community as the Holy Trinity. Ace Combat 4, Shattered Skies, Ace Combat 5, The Unsung War, and Ace Combat 0, The Balkan War. Note that this guide will be focusing on emulating the NTSC, or in other words, the USA releases of all three games as the fixes and cheats needed to address their emulation issues only work with those specific versions and not the European or PAL versions. We will also be using Spectabus, which is a PCSX2 front end which will make it easier to manage multiple games and their setups for the emulator. This is important as each game will need some specific settings enabled that the other two won't need. And with all that out of the way, let's get started. Mobius 1, engage. Clear to engage. To emulate these games, we'll be using PCSX2, as it is the best PlayStation 2 emulator currently available on devs or PCs. We will also be using Spectabus. Spectabus basically links to your install of PCSX2 and makes it much easier to set up and launch different games. It also allows each game to have its own individual settings, meaning that we won't have to juggle around a bunch of different configuration files or have to change settings every time you want to play a different game. Note that before you continue with this guide, you will need 7-zip and WinRAR installed to extract some of the zipped files that we'll be downloading. So I'd recommend that you download and install them before continuing. Links to both 7-zip and WinRAR will be in the video description. First off, let's make a folder to store all the files. If you followed part 1 of my emulation guide, you should already have a folder called Ace Combat Emulation or something similar. If not, then make sure to go to a location on your computer where you have a bit of space, as the final folder will be about 20GB in size. Then just right click and make a new folder. Inside of that folder, you can make another folder and call it PlayStation 2. This will be the folder we will be downloading all the files to just to keep everything together and neatly organized. Next, we need the BIOS file to get the emulator to work. Sadly, this is one of those files I can't directly link to, but it is easy to find, however. Just go to Google and search Emulation General Wiki BIOS. The first link should have more information on where you can find PlayStation 2 BIOS files. Now let's download the emulator. Just click on the link in the video description labeled Download Emulator. It should take you to the download page for all the different versions of PCSX2. This guide will be focusing on emulating on Windows PCs, so we'll be using the Windows release of PCSX2. Then just download the Windows binary version of the emulator. It should make it a bit more self-contained and easier to move around when needed. Also note that you will need 7-zip when you do eventually extract the emulator. Next, we'll download the latest release of Spectabus. Link to its release page will also be in the video description. Just scroll down a little bit to Assets and then click on this link to download it. Now, we'll go through the initial setup of PCSX2. First, extract the PCSX2 emulator using 7-zip. And then do the same for the BIOS files. Note that the BIOS, the zipped folder that you may have downloaded, might not be the same as shown in the video, so make sure that you use the appropriate tool for it. 
In this case, it's just a standard zip file, so it doesn't really matter what I use. I can use either 7-zip or WinRAR. Also, when you do extract it, make sure that you extract it to its own folder. Otherwise, things will get a little messy. Now, we need to get the BIOS file in the correct location. First off, go into the emulators folder, and then make a new folder, and call it BIOS. B-I-O-S. Then, go to the other folder that we extracted with all the BIOS files. We only really need to use one of these BIOS files, and I believe it doesn't really matter which one you exactly use. I, for example, use this one, which is the latest version of the North American BIOS. You can then just right click and copy it. And then go back to the other folder that we just made and paste it in here. If you want to, you can now go and delete this folder as you won't really be using any of the other BIOS files and it'll only really be taking up space. Now we can run the emulator for the first time. Just go into the folder and then double click the pcsx2.exe. For now, you can keep most of the settings default and click next. Keep all of these default as well. And then if you place the BIOS file into the correct location, it should show up in the console up here. If not, you can always just try to refresh the list or uncheck the use default setting and then browse to the proper location where you place the BIOS file. And then after a second, the emulator should pop up. We can now change some of the settings in the emulator so we don't have to change them later on for each game. First, click on config and then emulation settings. And then go down to GS window. First, we can change the aspect ratio to 16 by 9 and then increase the zoom by 0.5, so it'll be 100.5. This will zoom into the screen, hiding some weird colors and lines that some games show on the edges of the screen. You can also go to this checkbox to enable hide mouse cursor. This will hide the mouse cursor when you hover over the game window in both windowed and windowed borderless modes. Also, if you encounter any screen tearing or playing the games, you can enable VSync here to solve that issue. There doesn't seem to be any massive increase in input delay, so you might as well enable it anyways. Then, just press apply and head over to Speedax. Speedax can be used to gain some free performance, especially if you run into slowdowns here and there, or if your computer isn't strong enough to run the game at full speed all the time. The only downside, however, is that Speedax may introduce some micro stutter, which can make the games feel less smooth and sometimes jittery. If you want to change any of the settings here, or just disable Speedax entirely, you can just go here and uncheck this little checkbox here. You can then go and hover over each setting to get a little tooltip that explains exactly what each one does, and it'll even show if the settings are recommended or not. If you want to disable Speedax entirely, just uncheck this checkbox up here. Then just press apply and hit OK. Next, click on config again, then hover over controllers, and then click on plugin settings. First, go to pad 1, and in this bar on any of the options, right click and clear all. Then just click apply, and then go back to general. Now uncheck X input, click apply again, and then go back to pad 1, and now you can start assigning all the controls on your controller by clicking the button on the left, and then clicking the corresponding button on your controller. Note that if you'd rather want to use the trigger buttons for throttle control, and the shoulder buttons for your control instead of the original control scheme. You can do that by just swapping around those controls by assigning L1 and R1 to the trigger buttons and L2 and R2 to the shoulder buttons. This is more in line with modern control schemes in newer Ace Combat games, as well as other games like Project Wingman and even Grand Theft Auto V. 
After you've assigned all the controls, then just click apply, then go back to the general tab, and then re-enable X input. Go back to pad 1 one more time, and now you can assign the rumble motors by clicking on the big motor and the small motor buttons. You can even test if the motor actually functions. Then just click back to controls, and then assign the other motor as well. Now you can just click apply again. If your controls are not being picked up as DX inputs, you can now try binding them as X inputs instead to see if that works. It seems to be better to have them bound as direct input or DX inputs, as the sensitivities for some things like the analog sticks and triggers will be read correctly from various controllers. According to some of the supporting documentation, even the pressure sensitive face buttons on something like a PlayStation 3 controller should also work properly with DX input. On the other hand, X input might not always have the proper sensitivities for each control and it seems that it only works with Xbox type controllers or other controllers that are recognized as Xbox controllers. For example, using a PlayStation 4 controller with DS4 Windows. The sensitivity issue can be mitigated however by going to a specific control, for example the left trigger, clicking on it and then adjusting the sensitivity slider on the right side here so that it's not too oversensitive or undersensitive. Just note that the sensitivities can be adjusted while playing the game so you can test out the changes in real time. When you're done with all that, just remember to click apply and then you can click OK. Next, we'll be downloading the no interlacing codes as well as the Ace Combat specific widescreen patches and activating them in the emulator. The no interlacing codes essentially stop the emulator from going through the whole interlacing and deinterlacing process, improving the sharpness of the games and making them a bit easier to run as well. Skipping the entire process also fixes some major issues with Ace Combat 4, like for example the sun not being displayed properly and when used in conjunction with a different fix that we'll discuss later, it also fixes the aircraft textures for the player aircraft not displaying properly. For a more in-depth explanation on what the no interlacing codes actually does, as well as more in-depth information on what each setting of the emulator does for each game, I highly recommend checking out Hugo Avengers original Ace Combat emulation guide. My guide is somewhat based off of his guide, with the only changes being some of my own adjustments that I feel work a bit better, showing where all the settings are in the newer version of the emulator, as well as highlighting some of the new fixes that recently came out that weren't covered in his original guide. Now, go into the video description and download the no interlacing codes for all three games. After you've downloaded all three of the codes, make sure to select all three of them, and then move them to the cheats folder inside of the emulators folder. Next, click on the link in the description labeled widescreen patches. It'll take you to this Dropbox link where you can go to the top right, click the download button and then click the direct download option. These widescreen patches fixes an issue with Ace Combat 5 and Zero specifically where the camera and cockpit view is a little bit too zoomed out and you can see some elements which really shouldn't be seen. After you've downloaded it, just right click it and extract it with an appropriate tool. It's a normal zip file so it doesn't really matter what you extract it with. And then go in, take the two files and then move them to the cheats underscore ws folder in the emulators folder. Now with all the files in place, go back to the emulator, click on system, and then click on enable cheats, and then click on system again, and then enable widescreen patches. So both should have a check mark next to them. Now we'll set up Spectabus to work with the emulator. There's one small thing we need to do before this though. Since we're using the portable version of PCSX2, it will not create a folder under Documents, and that's where Spectabus needs to look for the emulator's configuration files to use as a base. So all we have to do is go to your Documents folder, create a new folder, and call it PCSX2, all caps, 
and then go into that folder, make another folder and call it INIS. These folders need to have exactly these names, otherwise it will not work properly. Now go to the emulators folder and to its INIS folder, then copy all of the configuration files and paste them into the new INIS folder we just made. Next, go and extract Spectreverse using 7-zip and extract it to its own folder. Then go into the folder and launch Spectreverse using this executable file. It'll ask you where you have PCSX2 installed, so just click the browse button and go to where you have PCSX2 extracted and double click its executable file. If it prompts you to do the first time setup, you can just skip this as we've already done it. If you'd like to, you can head up here and go change any settings that you'd like, for example turning on night mode, or changing the color of the emulator. What are we gonna do kid? I'll follow you! There are a couple of different methods on how to obtain the games. Also, again, I recommend that you use the NTSC, or in other words, USA releases, of all three games, as the known delacing codes and widescreen patches only work with those specific versions. Some of the methods on obtaining the games are sadly less legal than others, so time for a small disclaimer. I do not condone piracy of any kind, however, these games are getting older, they're becoming harder to find, especially for an affordable price or even in good condition. I mean, Ace Combat 4 recently had its 20th anniversary. Although I do not condone piracy, I do however support the idea of video game preservation so these games will never be forgotten. Ideally, you should own a physical copy of each game, but I understand that that's not a feasible option for every single person. The first method I'll be discussing is ripping the games from the original discs, and the other method is obtaining the games from an internet archive where they've been uploaded for preservation purposes. I'll explain both as best as I can. Before I discuss these methods, just quickly go and make a folder next to the emulators folder and call it something like games. Once you've obtained your games, you can then place them in this folder just to keep things a bit more organized. The first method is ripping the games from the original discs. This is the most legal way of doing it, however you will need to physically own the game discs, as well as have access to a CD or DVD drive on your computer or laptop. Actually, I don't have a CD or DVD drive readily available to demonstrate this. Instead, I've linked to a video by Tech James which shows how to use ImageVern to rip PlayStation 1 games from their original discs. The same method applies to PlayStation 2 games, but with the only difference being that when you are selecting where to save the game files to, you just set the file type to .iso instead of .bin. Now just go and give this video a quick watch, and when you have ripped your games, you can just skip to this timestamp. If you could not make use of this method however, then just keep watching for the alternative method. Let's say you're like me and you don't currently have access to a CD or DVD drive, or maybe you don't currently have access to your physical games for whatever reason. Maybe you don't want to further scratch the discs that you already own, or you'd rather play the NTSC version instead of whichever version that you currently own. If you fall into one of these scenarios, then there is another way to get the games onto your PC to use with the emulator. Remember it is recommended to actually own the games. Do not do this if you don't have the games, as it is technically illegal and considered piracy. I recommend heading over to r slash roms on reddit. It's a reddit community dedicated to discussing and helping people with classic video game files. They have something there called a mega thread, which will guide you in the right direction. Sadly, I can't say any more about this as I don't want the video to be taken down for copyright reasons. Remember that when you're searching the megathread, make sure to get the NTSC USA versions of all three games. After you have acquired the game files, 
you will need to extract them using either 7-zip or WinRAR. In my case, all three files are 7-zip, so I'll just extract them using that. Before we actually get to setting up the games, we first need to apply the black plane fix to Ace Combat 4. First, click on the link in the video description labeled AC4 Black Plane Fix. This will take you to the download page on ModDB. There, you can just click on the download now button, and then just give it a couple of seconds, and then it should download. We will also need the latest version of Python installed to make the patching program work. Link to the latest Python version will also be in the video description. It will take you to this page and you can just hit the download button to save. Once you've downloaded Python, just double click its executable file and install it with the install now option. Before we continue any further, just head up to view and make sure that file name extensions is enabled just to make it a bit easier to identify the files that we need to work with. Also, go into the games folder and just make a backup copy of Ace Combat 4 just in case something goes wrong during the patching process. Now, go and extract the black plane fix files using the appropriate tool, in this case it's a 7-zip file. I'll just extract it using 7-zip. Then, go into that folder and copy this file, black plane fix for ac04us.py and then go place it in the games folder next to the game files. Next, copy the full file name for the Ace Combat 4 file that we'll be applying the patch to. Make sure to copy the entire file name including the .iso extension. Now double click the black plane fix for ac04us.py and it should pop up with this window if you install python correctly. You can then just either control v or right click to paste the full file name. Then just make sure that the file name exactly matches the specific file that we want to patch. Then just press enter. And when it's done, you should be able to just press any button for the window to close. Setting up the games with Spectabus is pretty easy, especially after having set up the default settings already. Also, since all three games use almost identical settings, I will only be going through the settings once with Ace Combat 4 as an example. I will explain some of the settings that are important for each individual game. Note though, that if I don't specify that a setting is needed for one of the games, it just means that that setting should be identical over all three games. Afterwards, I will also quickly show Ace Combat 5 and Zero settings, just for those who want to confirm that the settings are correct. First off, you can start off by dragging the game files over to Spectabus. It should also automatically download the cover art. You can do the same for Ace Combat 5. And make sure you pull over the correct version of Ace Combat 4 and not the backup or copy that we made earlier. Now, you can right click on the game and click on game configuration. We can now first set up these settings before we actually get into the proper graphical settings. Full screen just makes sure that the game launches in full screen every time. No graphical interface, just makes it that the PCA62 UI doesn't display when you launch the game. Display BIOS when booting just shows the BIOS startup screen of the PlayStation 2 before the game actually launches. The rest of the settings can be kept as is. Now we can move on to changing the settings in the emulator itself. Just click on the video settings button and it'll take you straight to the video plugin settings menu. You can first change the render direct 3d 11 hardware OpenGL hardware will also work and may look a little bit better but it is a decent amount harder to run so i would rather recommend direct 3d 11 for most people 
Next, you can select the specific graphics card that you want to use, in case you might have multiple graphics cards in your system. Since we're using the no interlacing codes, we don't really need the interlacing setting anymore, so you can just set it to none. Now, change the texture filtering option to bilinear, forced excluding sprite. The other options cause some graphical issues with some UI elements in the games, or just don't look as good. Now, we can set the internal resolution for the game. The setting will determine how sharp the game looks, but is also the most performance intensive setting depending on how far you set it. So, if you run into any slowdowns, or stutters, or freezes, this is definitely the first setting that you should turn down. For Ace Combat 5 and Ace Combat 0, you can set the setting to what, whichever resolution you want, as long as it's not a custom resolution. Custom resolutions tend to break some stuff and cause some weird lines across the screen, so it's definitely not recommended. My recommendation for Ace Combat 5 and 0 though, is to run 4x native or higher if your computer can handle it. 3x native is actually slightly lower than 1080p, so on the average 1080p monitor, the game might look slightly blurry. So rather just run it at 4x native or higher. For Ace Combat 4 specifically, I recommend not running higher than 3x native. If you run the game at higher than 3x native, you'll have noticeable vertical black lines running across the screen in most instances. If you run it at 3x native or lower, you won't have those vertical black lines at all, and only some noticeable vertical lines in some specific cutscenes. Most notably, the first cutscene of the game, as well as the introductory cutscene when you stay on the title screen for a certain amount of time. If that bothers you, you can set it to native PSD resolution, but overall the game will look very blurry. My recommendation is to run Ace Combat 4 at 3x native, as those two cutscenes aren't really that important and you won't be seeing them very often anyways. What's important is that at 3x native, you won't have any vertical line issues during gameplay or any of the other normal cutscenes. Next, we can set the anisotropic filtering option. For Ace Combat 4, you can set this to 16x. Anisotropic filtering doesn't really have any impact on performance, so you might as well set it as high as it can go. Note though, for Ace Combat 5 and Ace Combat 0, you will need anisotropic filtering disabled, as it causes a weird issue where there's lines running across the aircraft's body and it almost looks like light is shining through gaps in the aircraft. Next, check the checkbox next to Enable Hardware Hacks and then press the button Advanced Settings and Hacks. First off, set the half pixel offset to Special Texture Aggressive and Round Sprite to half. If you plan on playing Ace Combat 4 at a higher resolution than 3x native, you will have to have Merge Sprite enabled to remove those vertical black lines. The downside though however, is that on nighttime missions or missions with very foggy weather, there's very noticeable heavy blurring around the aircraft and a lot of objects. If you want to avoid that, then you will have to disable Merge Sprite and set the resolution back to 3x native for those specific missions. If you don't want to constantly change the settings each time you want to play one of those missions, I recommend just sticking to 3x native, as I've mentioned before, and keeping Merge Sprite disabled. Ace Combat 4 will also need a Line Sprite enabled. This is because, even at 3x native resolution, on nighttime missions you may still notice vertical lines running across the screen, but only very faintly. A line sprite can help reduce this even more, so it's almost impossible to see the vertical lines on night missions. For Ace Combat 5, you will need to have a line sprite enabled to fix some vertical line issues in its menus. Ace Combat 5 will also need merge sprite enabled to fix some weird over blurring and vertical line issues during some very specific gameplay sequences, like for example when the Shinfaxi's burst missiles explode. Ace Combat Zero doesn't require a line sprite, but it does need merge sprite for the same reasons that Ace Combat 5 has it enabled, mainly for burst missile explosions like in the final mission, and for missions with haziness like Juggernaut. 
Now that we're done with the hardware hacks, you can then just click OK. Set MIP mapping to basic fast, TRC hack level to full direct 3D, and then just keep date accuracy to its fast default setting and blending accuracy to its basic recommended setting. Lastly, we can just pop into the shader configuration and turn on the FXAA shader. Basically, this helps to remove some of those jagged edges you see on straight line objects like edges of your wings and some other elements. It does however make the game slightly blurrier. It's completely personal preference if you want it turned on or not. Then you can just click OK and click OK again. Next we can quickly go into audio settings and then just turn the volume down to about 50% or less depending on whatever your preference is. PCSX2 like some other emulators tends to be very very loud out of the box. So if you don't want your ears to explode, definitely turn the volume down. And then just click OK. After that, you can just click this button to close this menu, and then you can double click the game to launch it. Note that it seems that you have to launch the game at least once for all the settings to actually save. So once you've gone through the settings for one game, just launch it and close it before continuing with the other two. So just double click the game, PCS 60 should start up and the game launches. You can then just double click to make the window smaller again. And then you can just close that and PCSX2 as well. One other small thing to note is that after you've set up one of the games and you're trying to set up the settings for the other game and you click OK after you've set up all the settings, it might pop up with a little error message here stating that it couldn't save the plugin settings. So it might just be worth it to close Spectabus and restart it before changing the settings in one of the other games. If you don't get any error message here after you clicked OK, then it means that the settings were saved correctly, and then you can just double click and launch the game to set this to actually properly save the settings. Then maybe just close Spectabus again and restart it before setting up the third game. And on screen now, I'll show my recommended settings for each individual game. Also, one last thing to remember is that when you start the games for the first time, remember to go into the options and then display or screen settings depending on the game and set the screen ratio to 16 by 9 otherwise the games will look very stretched. Also of note, there are still some emulation issues with all three games that haven't been resolved yet. Hopefully in the future some of these issues may be fixed, but for the time being we're just gonna have to deal with them. Luckily, they're only minor visual issues at most and shouldn't detract from gameplay all that much. On screen now, I'll show some visual examples of the most prominent issues that you may notice while playing through the games. There is one last extra thing we can do, and that is to set up Reva Tuner to help reduce microstutters. 
This step is not necessary at all and you can go play the games right now if you want to, but I would recommend doing this. Even if your frame rate might look stable and doesn't fluctuate much from 60fps, you may still experience micro stutters due to inconsistent frame times. The frame time is essentially how long each image is actually displayed on the screen and is measured in milliseconds. If that time in milliseconds is not consistent, it leads to micro stutters. Revertuner is a program that's usually used to limit frame rates, but it's also very good at smoothing out those frame times, making the games feel buttery smooth almost all the time. Just click on the link in the video description to go download Revertuner. It'll take you to this page where you can scroll down and get the download link here. After you've installed Revertuner, just go and open it. If it prompts you with an option, just click yes. Viva Tuner doesn't tend to open immediately, and will probably pop up with this icon down here, or under this little menu. You can then just left click on it once to actually open it. First, enable Start with Windows, so you don't have to turn on Viva Tuner every time you want to emulate the games. Then, click on the Add button, and then navigate to where you have PC SX2 installed, and then double click on the pcsx2.exe file. Make sure that pcsx2.exe is selected and then go to frame rate limit, click on it and then enter 59.94 and then press enter. Basically what we're doing is we're setting Reva Tuner's frame rate limit to 59.94 FPS for pcsx2 which is actually the same as PCSX2's NTSC frame rate limit, which is also 59.94 frames per second. So effectively, we're not slowing down the game at all, but we are smoothing out its frame times, making the game less stuttery and a lot smoother. Once you've set the frame rate, make sure to minimize the application. Don't close it, otherwise it won't work. Just minimize it. And that's it. Now you can enjoy Ace Combat 4, 5 and 0 on your PC with as few issues as possible with the best graphics settings. Part 3 of my guide will be covering the PSP Ace Combats, Ace Combat X, Skies of Deception and Ace Combat X2 or X Squared, Joint Assault. That video will be done a lot sooner than the part 1 and part 2 of my guide as setting up the PSP emulator is much easier and much more straightforward. But until next time, cheerio!